Hello and welcome to the Pender Investment Conference and the session on Hustle and Grit in the Private Technology World. We encourage you to ask questions in the panel on the, the right of your screen and we'll aim to answer them by the end of the session. I should also mention uh, this event is for information purposes only and should not be viewed as investment advice or an offer to buy or sell Pender funds or any of the securities we mention. And, and the discussion of performance is not an indicator of future results um, and all opinions as a, are as of today's date, and we may or may not share the views of our guests. I'm delighted to welcome Rebecca Lovell um, as our guest moderator, moderating a discussion between Christina Kendall and myself of Pender Ventures. Rebecca has been a leading uh, and supporting technology startups in Seattle area for the past 15 years, including running an angel investment program and working at a venture firm. From building the business of a tech news site to leading the City of Seattle's Office of Economic Development, she brings a deep and broad perspective to the startup ecosystem um, and prioritizes equity and education. She also has a few side hustles. She teaches entrepreneurship class at uh, the University of Washington MBA program and chairs the Washington DC based Center for American Entrepreneurship. Joining me on the panel today are two of my colleagues from Pender Ventures, Christina and Kendall. Uh, Christina joined us last year, um, and she's um, been on what I call three sides of the table. Um, she's been a, a tech executive at a large tech uh, firm, um, a VC investor, and been a founder entrepreneur. She's worked at Microsoft, heading up go to market for a multi-billion dollar product line that I think most of us know quite well held uh, board roles at various technology companies and associations throughout the US and Canada, um, and most recently successfully led the strategic exit of the company she founded, Integris. Uh, Kendall, uh, Kendall uh, decided he wanted a career in investments uh, while still playing uh, professional hockey with the NHL. Um, in fact, I believe he did uh, two of his CFA levels uh, between the long journeys between games. Um, and that still didn't put him off. Um, he joined Pender in 2014 on the public equity team, uh, where he found his passion for early stage businesses, and he moved across to the ventures team in late 2018. Now, before uh, we begin the panel uh, discussion, I thought it would be good to give you a bit of background um, and context of who Pender Ventures is. Um, and so with that, next slide, please. Um, so essentially, Pender Ventures is the private technology investing arm of Pender. Um, we're currently uh, five, a team of five. I uh, mentioned Christina and Kendall. Uh, Rolf and Tony joined in 2019. Rolf has been a longtime venture investor uh, over 20 years, investing in hard tech companies. And before that, he had a variety of operating roles uh, in companies such as Symbolic Sciences and McDonald Dotweiler. Tony has been uh, working um, in, uh, uh, with funds since 2003 in investing in finance. And myself, I've um, started my career in M&A um, uh, at a large investment bank and have been working uh, with early stage tech investing for the last 20 years and did a couple stints of startups along the way. It's important to note, in addition to this team, um, we really we have um, over a dozen venture partners or advisors comprised of experienced technology uh, executives and entrepreneurs who provide great advice and guidance on our due diligence, market insights, and technical expertise for expertise for all of our holdings. Next slide. Um, as many of you know, um, the roots of Pender are venture capital. It's a real differentiator for us. Um, this experience means we're not only financial analysts, but business analysts, because um, at, at the end of the day, that's what we're investing in. So as, as an asset class, you know, venture capital aims to achieve above market returns, um, really the following ways. Um, it provides uh, access to an unless, unlisted pool of companies that as individuals uh, would be tough to find and to participate in. It provides exposure to the next up and coming technology companies, not just the large tech um, companies that you already know and, and frankly you can invest in directly yourself. Um, and perhaps most importantly, 
um, in our world, finding the right company is just the right, the first step. Um, as you hear about shortly, the real work begins after we make the investment and continues on uh, for the years that we hold on the investment until we sell it um, or it goes public. Next slide, please. Uh, we invest in private technology companies that have hit an inflection point in their stage of development. Um, so they develop a product, launched it, and have early customer pull. This customer pull uh, means they have a tangible use case or ROI that they provide their customers, and they're well on their way to understand how to sell and market effectively to this customer base. And really, that's what they often use their capital for. Here on the bottom right, you see a list of our key holdings at this time, and you can see uh, our website for further details. Uh, with that, we can stop the presentation and move on to the panel discussion, and I will hand it over to Rebecca to lead our discussion. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be with all of you today. I've known Christina for years and alongside all of you really look forward to getting to know uh, part of the Tender team here, more deeply understanding what drives your decision making and frankly, what makes you tick. So before we get into this, I really just want to acknowledge the moment that we are in. Uh, to say that 2020 and 2021 so far have been tumultuous uh, is an understatement. Uh, so many communities around the world are still so deeply in the grips of this global health pandemic. It has destroyed lives, it has crushed economies, uh, and still um, we have the privilege of working with innovators. And I look forward to learning from you how, how our investment and in these innovators can help our entire world, frankly, speed out of this curve. So, Maria, let, let me start with you um, again to say that uh, the last year and a half has had an impact on startups is, is putting it mildly. Share with me uh, the journey that you've been on with your portfolio companies. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, and to say uh, turbulent and volatile, yes, is an understatement. And really, when you think about it, um, turbulence is the life of building, uh, of starting a business in many ways. Um, although that was an exceptional year last year, and uh, not only for all types of businesses, but obviously for us uh, personally. Um, so really, we worked um, very closely uh, with our companies as they quickly had to assess um, you know, what it meant to their businesses and perhaps most importantly, their employees. At the end of the day, for uh, most technology companies, their employees are their assets, their intangible assets. Uh, so first and foremost, you know, safeguarding them um, and figuring out how to work in the new world um, was their priority. Um, and then really quickly, you know, um, obviously also assessing how it impacts their customers, their revenue, whether they had to raise uh, their, their ability to raise more capital. Um, and luckily, I would say by their very nature, being technology, um, most in our portfolio, um, very pleased to say, responded very well. Um, and actually, you know, the very best companies, I would say, found a way to flourish and even lean in um, to the moment. Um, you know, and a few companies uh, in our portfolio I can speak of uh, very uh, specifically too. So one of our companies is called Clarius Mobile Health. And they ha have a portable ultrasound uh, wireless uh, scanner. And so very quickly, they moved forward their use case for hospitals where um, the scanner can be used for a fast um, and quick uh, lung detection for pneumonia. Um, so this was something that, um, you know, very quickly when hospitals had to find an area to triage, this could be moved around easily. Um, and in fact, what was previously considered a security risk being wireless was actually seen as a positive um, because there is a, a lot less potential for bacterial contamination on wires and things like that. Um, and, and that's been, you know, allowing them to move forward in that market um, still today. Um, another example is a company called Teradici. Um, Teradici essentially provides the underlying technology that allows for high performance uh, computing work to happen in the cloud, things like design, graphic design, uh, gaming development, things like that. Um, so in the cloud or remotely. Um, so uh, in fact, without um, Teradici, a lot of movie uh, production editing wouldn't have happened and 
things like, um, you know, the Marvell series wouldn't have been able to be viewed uh, during the pandemic. Um, and then, you know, I think of another portfolio company, Jane App, um, which does scheduling um, and booking um, for paramedical clinics, things like um, physio and, and chiropractor clinics, um, who are obviously, you know, hit very hard um, during the pandemic. Um, but it gave them an opportunity to move ahead uh, one of their features, which was a telehealth um, video uh, functionality, and so that their practitioners can still provide services to their customers um, and still keep their business going during the pandemic. Um, and then this element really actually allowed them to gain market share um, from their competitors as they didn't have a similar feature. So, and I would just say, you know, the human element was uh, the most interesting. You know, we saw leaders either step up um, and show great leadership um, and uh, tenacity um, or, and adapt quickly um, or, or not. So in many ways, it actually made our due diligence jobs easier um, when we're looking at uh, new investments, um, looking for those leadership qualities. Got it. So much to unpack there, Maria, you know, starting with, you know, we, we love to spend our time with entrepreneurs who as a lifestyle choice, by definition, embrace uncertainty. But those that were particularly adept at listening to the market, leaning in and showing that resilience uh, seem to have separated themselves from the pack and really become part of the solution as we learn to cope and adapt and hopefully succeed. Um, so for the rest of the panel, just quick note, you know you can chime in as the spirit moves you, but you don't have to. Just to set the stage a little, we've got a luxurious 28 minutes or so. So I'm going to move the conversation along. And then at that time, uh, those of you who are tuning in will open it up to Q&A from you. If you have a question and you're worried you're going to forget it, put it in the q and I'm going to scan those as we finish up with the panelists. But um, and, unless each either of you want to contribute on that, you really um, teed up my next question beautifully, Maria, and that is focusing on those leadership qualities, the X factor, you know, that we love to invest in when we meet that founding team and CEO. So, Christina, you've been one of those CEOs and founders. I'm going to turn this question to you. What? How would you describe the traits of successful CEOs? Uh, you know, through various challenges, but really at various stages of a startup. What do you look for at each of those stages? So it's, you know, it's a really good question. The, the things that we look for are really different depending on the stage. Um, at the earliest stages, we're really looking for the ability to deal with ambiguity um, and navigate the chaos uh, with empathy and with grace. And while continuing to lead other people through it and bring folks along. Um, so for instance, you know, my own personal journey starting in Tegris, it was an idea in a PowerPoint presentation when we raised our first round of funding. And the market was brand new. Uh, this thing called data privacy was looming on the horizon. GDPR was again, uh, had been passed into law but hadn't come into effect yet. And everybody was scrambling, trying to figure out what to do and how to approach it and what aspect of it should they deal with first. And it was, it was a really difficult market to navigate because it was brand new. So nobody knew who the buyer was. Nobody knew who, what the core selling scenario was going to be because it was a completely untried market. All of the budget to date had been spent on consulting services, not on software. And so we needed to identify the buyer, the scenario, the technical solution, the go-to-market strategy, and really try to assess all of these moving pieces at once. And I'm sure lots of folks have heard the, uh, the cliche, you're, you're building the plane while it's taking off. Well, nothing felt truer in that moment of, oh gosh, we need some wings or, oh geez, we need an engine, we should grab that. And it's just, it's a lot of chaos and a lot of ups and downs. And so when we're looking at early stage uh, founders, what we're looking for are people who don't shy away from the ambiguity, people who are okay and comfortable in the chaos. And really folks with just that incredible grit, incredible attitude, that ability to push through no matter how hard it gets and pull people through with them. And so that almost impermeable positivity can do, every challenge is really just an opportunity in disguise. That's what we're looking for from, from the leadership. Um, now, as a- 
Yeah, and, and I'm gonna say no. That's that's a great list, and I feel like if you had bottled up the sort of Christina Bergman attributes, you distilled those beautifully in terms of that early stage. But when you think about, you know, and I think this is kind of what you're setting up. Like I'm working with a CEO right now who has all of those qualities and just raised a ten million dollar round, and we had this kind of heart to heart where, like, hey, buddy, what got you here? isn't going to get you to your series B. So, so take it away, Christina, what kind of are you looking for, whether it's that CEO or another leader that's going to get that, that company, that startup to the next level? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, as a company scales, uh, well, let me back up a bit. When most people think of bureaucracy, they associate it as being a negative thing. But there is a certain amount of bureaucracy that allows a company to function and scale so that not everything gets recreated every time somebody does something. And so those systems and those procedures, and we heard this morning from Ron Shape, from Panera fame, Act 3 Holdings fame, about how those systems and procedures and systems of accountability are really important at scale. That's where we start to look for some of those, those traits in, in CEOs as the companies start to scale, the ability to be metrics driven, the ability to know the drivers and levers for your business, um, the ability to see the patterns and create systems that support the patterns that help you grow and leverage. So not everything gets rethought every single time somebody does it. And those characteristics of company building and system building, it's a different skill set. And there are rare people that can take something from the very earliest stages all the way through to post IPO, but they're rare. And as often as not, you need to surround the founders with, mm -hmm. with more experience who've done things at that stage. And that's true across all functional areas of building a company, not just top leadership. Now that doesn't mean the CEO gets replaced, but it does mean they get very supported by lots of very complementary skill sets. And so when we're looking at CEOs at that growth stage, we're looking for folks with, that not only have that system level thinking, but that also have that deep self-awareness of where mm -hmm. this lie. But we can have grown up conversations with them and say, hey, you're doing great over here. Here's where you need help. We have some resources to help you. Let me introduce you to such and such person. Maybe they're an advisor, maybe they're an employee, maybe they're a partner, but let me help augment and support you as you continue to grow. And that's where you know folks like Maria Kendall and I can leverage our network and really put force behind the company to help them be as successful as possible. Absolutely. I love that. Self-awareness is such a critical trait that I know I look for in founders. And I think it's that special blend of confidence and humility that enables them to look in the mirror and say, I don't have this and I'm OK finding someone who is better than I am at that. Right. That's a really special, uh, special combination. Um, so we, we've talked about the moment we're in, what it takes to be a leader at different stages and different scenarios for these companies. Um, Kimbala, I kind of want to shift to you and pop up a level uh, to think about kind of more broadly the Pender philosophy. I mean, we can sit here and talk about, you know, what it means to be a venture capitalist, but but I know that that each of you share a passion for more than just financial returns but really think you know, more deeply and more broadly about environmental impact, a social impact, what are the governance issues? You know, Christina kind of teed up some of these geeky bureaucratic concerns, but I think it goes much deeper than that. So could you kind of share with us sort of how that drives your decision-making and might be part of your selection criteria or part of your involvement with a company as they grow? Absolutely, and, and and Rebecca, what you are speaking to, right, is is really the the ESG framework, and and so exactly. um, environmental, social, and governance uh, standards. Well, and then and then it's also great that you kind of talked about oh, what is Pender as a whole, right? And so first and foremost, Pender as a whole, we uh, recently signed up uh, for the UN PRI, which is the UN. Um, uh, principles were responsible in testing, and then also uh, the IRA, which is the Canadian uh, Responsible in Investing Association, right? And so what that means is really we have an obligation to incorporate ESG standards into our investment process. And, and at the highest level, that is uh, thinking about things in terms of opportunities and risk, more from a, from a 
monetary standpoint, right? And, and, and there's tons of research now that shows you cannot ignore um, sort of ESG impacts on portfolio companies, whether in the public market or private markets. And so as we move though beyond that, so it's not just monetary risk, right? You also then have to think about, well, what is the impact, you know, your portfolio company is having on the world? And, 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 and we're really in a unique position on the private side because of we get to, to, to actively engage with our portfolio companies and roll up our sleeves, right? And, 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 and so this is kind of now ties to the underlying metrics or the underlying sub segments of ESG, which in our opinion is things like diversity and equity and inclusion. Um, also talking about just different social impacts, environmental impacts, all of those sorts of things too, right? So at the end of the day, what do diversity, inclusion and impact have in common? Like at the end of the day, we're, we're, we're thinking about how to make the world a better place or that are, you know, first and foremost, our companies are not making the world a worse, a worse place than before. And so it could sound puffy, but, uh, you know, a more diverse and inclusive world is a better place. And it also allows these companies, in our opinion, to make, um, improve their decision making, right? And improve also the resilience of the organization in terms of the uh, uh, diverse perspectives that they have around the table. And we've leaned in on our venture partners. Maria talked about our you know, 12 venture partners or 13 venture partners that are around the table. And, and we have one in particular that's an HR consultant and, 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 and can really get hands on with moving these companies forward. We have a perspective that we can't change the world and how it is today, right? So not all of our companies going in are going to be as diverse as we want to. We're going to have the same impact we want to. But how can we actually roll up our sleeves and sort of change things going forward? And, and that's huge as well. Now, thank you for teeing that up because really my question is, it, you know, it's, I think it's so important to state your values and be transparent about that. And I'm just wondering how you operationalize that. Does ESG and DEI become a, a selection criteria or a filter mm -hmm. uh, or on your vast checklist of things that you're looking for and potential investments? And or is that something that you lean into and work on, you know, using your resources to consult with the team? And if any of you have any examples, I'd love to sort of hear about where the rubber meets the road. Yeah, so, so, so yes, there is a negative selection that we will do. I think we are fortunate in the fact that, you know, we're dealing with digital first companies. And so for us coming across a company that has a significant negative impact on the environment, right? Um, is rare. And so we don't, but at Pender as a whole, like there, there are things that, that Pender as a whole needs to think about that in our other asset class. But as it relates to us, that is rare. But as it relates to now social impact, right? If we see during our due diligence process, any sort of indications of mis, like of employees being mistreated, um, of thinking about the stakeholders in which the company interacts with. And if there's significant red flags there, for sure, like, like that would, mm -hmm. that would uh, uh, count out a company for our investment. And then there are things that we've run into from the people aspect or the social impact because how important integrity is to us going in and, and, and something that we don't really, uh, we can't flex upon, right? Mm -hmm. And then, but beyond that, so more often than not, it is about, you know, going forward, right? How, and getting alignment. And so we talk about, you know, our, our sort of three principles of diversity, alignment, and engagement, right? And so we have to be aligned with the company in how we think about the world and about, you know, our principles and the fact that we do believe that, diversity and will improve the company's decision making, improve the management's decision making, and make the company more res more resilient to different mm -hmm. different shocks that come to the company, right? Like these mm -hmm. are things we need to get alignment with. And we do it pretty early on before we're making the investment in all of those sorts of things as part of the due diligence process to understand um, really are value add and to make sure that it's also what the company believes as part of their 
ethos as well. Mm -hmm. Well, it's so good to hear that you've baked it into your processes. Here's another example where processes really help. You know, I think we have been in the midst of a reckoning. Uh, and, and I think there's been greater acknowledgement of, frankly, centuries of institutionalized racism and systems that perpetuate that. And while it's lovely for that acknowledgement to happen and for statements to be made, it won't become a, mo a movement. It'll rather just be a moment until you operationalize and systematize, systematize and build processes to ensure that you are consistent in applying your philosophy. So that's that's fantastic to hear. Thank you for sharing that commitment. Um, I wanna kind of open it up to, to all of you and each of you have, have shared some different perspectives on leadership and values and integrity, but this is always a controversial one and kind of the classic phrasing is do you bet on the jockey or the horse i imagine each of you has your own perspective on what are the key um reasons or the key reason that you choose an investment is it the person is it the market is it the tech ready set go lightning round i want to hear from all of you on this well i'm happy to take a stance on <laughs> all right you go christina <laughs> <laughs> this, this is when uh, we've debated internally and, and, you know, obviously we've got differing opinions, but I, I think they're all valid in their own way. Um, my personal opinion on this is that I would put market as the first, the number one, um, because you could have an amazing team, amazing tech in a terrible market and they'll only ever get terrible returns. Um, <laughs> whereas you could have a great market with a mediocre team and mediocre tech and still get great returns. And so my humble opinion, and I know my, my peers will disagree with me, my humble <laughs> opinion is I think the first qualifier is market. Like, is there a big growing, fast growing market with a burning need? Do people say, oh, I can't live without this. I must have it now. Um, or is it one of those myth kind of fizzly markets? You know, I, I think market is the first filter. And then I would put people as a very, very close second. But I, 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 think, I think market's number one. Disagree with me. All right, Maria, I'm going to pass it over to you. Yeah, as, uh, as Christina <laughs> knows, I definitely disagree. I think it's... Uh, <laughs> The people's first. Um, and I love how you use my same argument against me. That's great. Um, I, th um, I think, uh, you know, great businesses are are led by the people that get them there. And and so I think actually you can take, frankly, a mediocre product and maybe a market, um, but great leaders will make that endeavor a success. Um, and, and vice versa. Um, I don't think products or technology can sell themselves. Um, and so there's lots of good examples of great um, technologies that never unfortunately made it to market uh, that you and I have never used because they weren't executed well uh, by great leaders. So um, I think it's uh, all about, you know, the leadership being able to recognize, be strategic, and then capitalize on those opportunities. Now, it's also, I think, probably the hardest thing to really evaluate um, and, and, you know, things like, obviously you can evaluate, uh, skills and competencies, but things like, um, integrity, um, you know, that tenacity, all of those longer term traits, um, and their, you know, their ability to hire and attract other great people and that combination of humility and confidence that you talked mm -hmm. about, um, you know, other than, you know, starting to work with them from, uh, you know, well before you actually make the investment and seeing if they do what they say they're gonna do, there's really, it's quite difficult to evaluate. So we end up working with companies, uh, you know, before, quite a bit before we make the investment. And then just to provide some data to counteract my colleagues' <laughs> perspective, um, I found a study <laughs> and, uh, um, called, you know, in fact, what are the factors that venture capitalists um, look at? It's a bit dated, uh, although it was updated a couple years ago, and it was it surveyed like uh, almost 900 BCs, and um, almost 50% said people were their number one factor, which is did maybe not. So 50, did the other 50 say market? Just out of here. <laughs> it was a close number two, close number two. But you know, maybe what's surprising for the audience is valuation or price was like one percent, so quite low in mm. the list of factors. Mm. Rebecca. All right. 
up for a false argument here because <laughs> she's getting it as if it's either or when really it's an and, but I'm happy to argue the either or. I, I don't disagree with anything you said around the importance of people. I think it's just a kind of what order do you flip it in, but I would say they're like both super, super, super important. And it's interesting that like tech hasn't, hasn't hit one of those top ones yet for us. Mm. Well, Kendall, you've now heard from, I guess, technically 902 VCs. We've got the study <laughs> and we've got these two right here. Uh, are you going to be a tiebreaker or bring another element into the discussion? <laughs> yeah, so, so, so um, if, if it's an, an either or question and if I had to pick, I am on the people front. Um, you know, maybe it's not a cop out or whatever because uh, of this seniority of Maria of North. But no, I, the the I would have though been on the other side before I sort of started working more and more actively with with companies, and and then also having tangible examples. And 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 so um, I think you you have to bring into context on what's the pool in which you're investing in. And I'm going to use a stereotype, but it's, you know, directionally accurate. So if you're a Silicon Valley PC that is, you know, going after, you know, just call it the Airbnbs of the world, the Ubers of the world, these consumer facing businesses that we know that tend to be winner take all markets, right? And you're shooting for 100x returns or if you need to and sort of have a couple of those in your portfolio then the market becomes a little bit more important right and so sure. this this differentiates us in terms of like our call portfolio allocation or the pool in which we hunt we are quite frankly uh, uh okay we don't need to have 100x returns because um we're cognizant of the capital going into the company you know these these pioneer type outcomes of companies also will have a ton of risk and flow. And so if you're not operating in that pool, if you're not in like this, you know, specifically the Silicon Valley ecosystem hunting for those, um, it can be really horrible from a portfolio return perspective if you're just getting everybody that tends to be the loser in winner take all markets. And so Jane Software is a great example of this when the fact that it's a fragmented market. If you look up like, chiropractors, uh, chiropractor software solutions or acupuncture software solutions or paramedical software solutions, there's going to be hundreds of competitors, right? It just seems like this market that's got hundreds of competitors, it's not new, all these sorts of things. But they have these qualitative product design. It's really the people behind it that, that, that have created this, this fantastic company that is able to operate in this market and win market share because there's not anybody that's a consolidated player the fact that there's all of these different fragmented solutions but no one's consolidated it means that there's a need right but no one's been going out there and doing it the right way and so and it really was the people it's the people behind it that i wouldn't have been able to have that in my thesis like you're going to be the one um but 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 uh, they have been thus far and sort of the reasons are because of the people aspect well, I have to hand it to you for threading that needle beautifully, um, acknowledging that not all markets are created equal and that depending on whether you're consumer or enterprise facing or just how fragmented that market is, that's going to have more or less of a factor on the team's ability to execute and succeed. Okay. So nicely done, all three of you. That's given us, given us all something to chew on and continue to think about. But but that really kind of plays out in terms of as, as each of you, and I really want to start with Maria, given all of this, how do you know or believe or have conviction that a company is ready for investment by Pender? Yeah, so uh, obviously after we've uh, gotten behind and believe in the people, um, you know, at this stage, <laughs> to be clear, um, uh, <laughs> um, as you know, I think we've uh, alluded to in the presentation, uh, we, we really focus in on that inflection stage as, as opposed to say the seed or uh, inception stage of a company. So. That means the company has launched product, um, has some early customer or partner traction, 
Um, and hopefully that's a really good indication of product market fit, um, which is quite important, obviously, as well, particularly at this stage. So really, um, at this point, they should um, have a really good idea of the drivers um, and the levers in their business to really move it to the next level. Um, and therefore, we understand exactly where they're going to invest and where our dollars are going to help them move to that next level. And, and essentially what we're basing the investment on, it's more the, ex the execution thereafter. So they should know things like, okay, if they were in the early adopter phase, how do they get into more mainstream customer base? Um, what features, uh, what are the features in alignment with the market um, necessary? Um, they should have kind of granular level data um, that uh, where they at least either know or have a theory on if I'm going to spend a dollar on uh, Google ads, it's going to get me this many um, qualified leads um, and things like that. Um, and so, you know, we understand, therefore, where our money is being used and what is the next inflection point that that will get them to. Nice. Well, um, you know, we know that uh, the value that you bring really just starts with writing a check. Um, and I hear you talk about product market fit and execution and team. And I'm wondering uh, for each of you, uh, how do you find your, yourself spending your time with your portfolio companies? And talking to so many VCs, some of them feel like they're part time recruiters, you know, an extension of, of the team in that capacity. Others are feel like part-time salespeople where you're opening up your relationship network uh, and helping with their their pipeline of deals. Um, I'm guessing that each of you spend your time where you think is most valuable and most important for a company's success. But could we just get a quick lightning round from each of you of how you describe your post-investment involvement? Yeah, I mean, I can I can kick it off. Um, usually around a, a series A, the questions that folks are asking are really consistent. It's the when do I bring on a VP of sales? Who should I hire? What should they look like? How do I start to flesh out my go to market? Because largely by then, the the best salesperson at the company has been the founder CEO. And they're usually the ones going and getting the majority of the deals done, figuring out that product market fit, figuring out the key metrics. Um, but it's that next critical hire of bringing on a VP of sales that's so difficult. Mm -hmm. And um, I think a, a lot of mistakes that uh, founders make with that first hire is thinking that they need to have everything figured out before they bring on their first VP of sales or their first salesperson. And there's a uh, very kind of unicorn-esque a unique salesperson that exists out there that's a strategic doer, a player coach, um, where that person can help you figure out what that sales go to market strategy is. You don't have to have it completely baked. And they're really good at providing feedback and listening to customers' needs, listening to what they're saying and what they're not saying, and filtering that back into product and into engineering to help build a better product that better serves their needs. And that strategic salesperson at the early stage, I think, is really critical to that Series A stage company when they're figuring out what do we need to be successful in this market. I don't think this founder CEO has to know everything. They should be able to their ways along. But that's where you can really start to augment the team with folks with experience who are strategic doers and can get out there and help the company figure out how to take this to market to maximize the revenue opportunity such a critical inflection point when that CEO has to let go a little bit and trust the next leader to co-architect uh, success in that role. Well, Kendall and Maria, unless you have anything burning to add on that, right on cue, we had our first question come in through the Q&A. So uh, if you want to sort of redirect or add or, I don't know, even support what Christina said, <laughs> chime in now, otherwise I'm going to take it to a question. Oh, and we'll oh. come back to all three of you at the end before we close, just as a point of process. Kendall. Done, done. Yeah, sorry, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll quickly add uh, yeah. to Christine's comment and then, and then let uh, uh, either one of them take uh, the question, which is great. So mm -hmm. um, what I would add is, is as I'm talking to, to prospective portfolio companies, right, and, and they're asking, okay, what's the value add that you can provide? I think Fundamentally, we also have to talk about what differentiates us at Pender. So why would they take our check versus somebody else's, right? I think there's these, you know, 
there's now a certain level of things that you have to bring to the table where right? you have to be able to help a company recruit, you have to be able to help with go to market execution, things like that. Like what's some intangibles that we have? And so um, first, Pender, you know, I can kind of unequivocally say we're, we're one of the only ones in Canada now that can go from early stage private markets all the way through to the public markets. And so that gives us a unique perspective mm -hmm. in all the things Christina was talking about, how to scale the company, right? And sort of how to go from Series A, not only to Series B and Series C, but also maybe through to the public markets. And so there's some, you know, stories there and some examples there of how we've been able to do that. And I think that has resonated um, because it's not something that a lot of VCs in Canada have experienced doing. And then also we've, we've, we've kind of touched upon it a little bit before, but we have, you know, our 13 venture partners, which is, we lean into that a lot more than others do. And so we realize we're not going to be, uh, the three of us or the five of us are not going to be expert for the whole Pender group, but there's going to be experts that we can lean upon um and and the specific areas whether it's hr or hardware development for a hardware company or like things like that right so it's like specific unique expertise on onto the problems and then and then lastly the other thing uh, um that uh that has been sort of resonated is just that people aspect and the diversity aspect and, and sort of how much we lean into that more so than others may do um and HR and, and sort of people and scaling companies also a huge problem at that sort of inflection point where they don't have an HR leader or they're thinking about how to system systematize things and so that is something else. Beautiful and and brilliant segue here into our first question, which I'll tee up for Maria or Christina. Uh, thank you, Richie, for the question. Team, what cri what criteria do you use to determine if the investment was a mistake? And if so, due to being private, how would you exit? How do you course correct when you have that realization? Yeah, and it's not always easy to do. You know, I find uh, when companies aren't successful, um, so they're not, you know, growing their, you know, sales are not there, they're not getting the customer traction or partner traction. It's often due to three potential, usually three potential factors, um, the people um, <laughs> and uh, uh, the product market fits not there. There's not that burning need um, or problem they're solving, um, or they're too early. And those ones are particularly painful because they probably, you know, globbed onto an early idea, but they're like 10 years or more too early. Um, and uh, they need a quite a bit of capital to keep going um, uh, to, to see through success. So, um, you know, we really, it's the company performance um, that determines that. You know whether we continue supporting really depends on um, if something changes. Like we need to, you know, look at the investment as almost a new investment, and has, is something going to change in one of those three areas that we therefore believe we would, if this was a new investment, we would write a fresh check today. Otherwise, it is just good money after bad. Um, and you know, being private and trying to sell, you know, a company that's not performing is very difficult. Yeah. You know, there is the odd occasion. Um, where it's maybe a nice feature. And so hopefully you can get some of your costs back by selling to a competitor or a partner. And by the way, most M&A um, is to people that, or entities that the company has worked with before. Um, or, you know, we, maybe we can sell some IP if there is, but it's very okay. difficult um, to actually sell a company, um, frankly, whether it's a, a private or public uh, sometimes as well. Now, that's a, that's a great observation and that you avoid that sunk cost bias, right? And just don't throw good money after bad, but ask yourselves, would you do this today? Um, so asset sales are an opportunity, uh, strategic acquisitions, mergers, another. Uh, anything to add, Christina or Kendall? I mean, I'm tempted to make a quip about the market not being big enough, but I'll let it. <laughs> great. Any, any other questions um, from... The audience from our participants today. I am more than happy to redirect it to our panel. I know there are questions I am sure you would have loved that I asked and I didn't get to. And so I want to make sure that you're able to share some parting words of wisdom here. Um, 
so let's go ahead and start, uh, Kendall, with you. Um, if there's one thing you would love the participants in this call today to take away with them about you, about your investment thesis, about the way you do business, um, any or all of the above, what would you like to share? Yeah, um, I think quite quickly, it, it would be for people that are that are new to the venture capital as an asset class, right? It, mm -hmm. it, it's, um, it's not everything that sort of you read about or like the splash stories that, that sort of are picked up by the news. And so I think inherently a lot of people think it's a uh, sort of a, a shoot from the hip, high risk, high return, right? And, and, and that's not always the case. Um, we, we have found um, sort of what we think is a unique thesis on these inflection stage companies and um, that we can find outlier returns or, or sort of above market returns, um, but not necessarily, you know, having to shoot for the hundred or thousand X, X outcomes every time. And so I think our, our, our sort of portfolio of traction thus far can speak to that. And then, and then just thinking about it from like the alternative asset class and, and sort of, you know, there's people now that give, okay, well, I want to provide my clients or, or, or I'm thinking about upping my exposure into alternatives in general to consider and to do research on what the typical venture capital asset allocation is amongst the world. I think as Canadians, unfortunately, we tend to be more conservative in our alternatives that we think about are real estate mm -hmm. and infrastructure and things like that, but that there is um, or underweight in Canada and, and sort of all the technological trends we talked about, this is a way to benefit from that, but it's also part of like a holistic portfolio, portfolio allocation as you talk about venture capital in the alternative pocket. So just just sort of the research and 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 try and gather uh, a perspective on if and if how much sort of you think venture capital should be um, within that alternative asset class. No, that's a great addition, and certainly everything we've heard today, we know it's not for the faint of heart. The sort of venture mechanics are that you know, out of any ten investments. One, maybe two, we'll call the other bet, cover all of the other bets. And so, you know, leaning into the ones that, that you can see get to that next level, uh, clearly important. And, and you know, you're, you're doing more than just writing checks. You're staying involved. You're thinking about positive social and environmental impact. And I will share one of my biases in addition to, you know, getting to work with these amazing innovators and support them. It is not small business, but new business that is the job creators in this economy. The Kauffman Foundation did this incredibly pervasive study showing that net new job creation is with companies that are five or fewer years old. And you're part of the economic engine, right? That's that's creating jobs and driving the economy. So a lot to consider in this very unique asset class. Thank you, Kendall. Um, Maria, would you like to share some closing comments? Yeah, um, and just maybe, uh, a couple comments. Um, you know, Canada really does actually punch above our weight in terms of technology and tech development. We're obviously a much younger and much, much smaller um, industry vis-a-vis uh, -vis our southern neighbors. But um, <clears throat> when we do tech, we do it great. Um, uh, and and I think it's it's an exciting time, I think, because we're more at the earlier stages of an ecosystem. Um, it does take a village, as I know you know qu quite well, Rebecca, to build um, any startup business, um, not just in technology. Um, and, you know, I think at, at Pender, I think we're in a unique position as being one of the few funds out there um, that really seek to understand the business, right? And not just uh, the markets and really help, you know, drive hopefully alpha for our investors. Um, and so, you know, because of um, our unique ability, um, we can really bring that to bear, um, our ex expertise and our network, you know, from private to public, um, which really has come to light over the last year, for example, when all of that was an option for our companies. Um, when, you know, in a cycle, do uh, uh, private companies can raise capital privately at very nice valuations, uh, obviously a decent M&A market, and also they can go public um, at the same time. Um, so it, it was a very good time. Um, and then, you know, expertise from equity um, to debt, 
um, and from startup to exit. Um, so I think, you know, we're really uniquely positioned to uh, seat and make investments um, in those areas. And understand the full life cycle. Excellent. Um, so Christina, I know you're newer to the Pender team, but over the last year, I uh, would love to hear about some of your observations and what drove that decision. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I mean, honestly, I'm going to, this is hysterical, but after filtering for the market of venture capital, I chose the team of <laughs> Pender because I, <laughs> they were a great group of people. This is going to be the debate that never ends. Um, I, I, I really, really like the team. And I think uh, the fact that their reputations preceded them in the best possible way. Anytime I reached out to anybody in the community, it was nothing but glowing things about the, the Pender group. And so for me, that made my decision to, to join the team really, really easy. Um, and I think it's, it's fun because we all have very diverse perspectives, very diverse backgrounds, different opinions. And when we have those different opinions, it allows us to uncover underlying assumptions, maybe holes in our logic, things that we're not seeing that someone else is seeing. And that combination of skills as you know, investors and operators and entrepreneurs and folks from all sorts of different backgrounds helps us make our, the companies we invest in better because we're bringing all of that to the table when we invest in a company. It's not just one person working on it, it's a whole team working on it and a whole team collaborating and discussing issues as they come up and figuring out how we might help. Um, and so I think that's the part that I'm most excited about is the chance to get to work with Marie and Kendall and everyone else on the team. Like we just, we have a lot of fun. We, we work hard, but we also have a lot of fun together and have some good laughs. And so it's just really great to get to work with such an awesome group of people. And it's great to get to invest in such cool new technology companies and help them grow. Love it. Well, way to be the brand, all three of you, and exhibiting how diversity can lead to richer discussions, and in the case of your investments, better outcomes. Um, so as we close out here today, I just want to thank you all again uh, for the opportunity to join this conversation. Great to get to know uh, Maria and Kendall better. And Christina, I learn something new about you every time. Um, so again, it's been a real pleasure. Thanks for sharing part of your day with us. Uh, be well. Thank Fantastic. You. Well, thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. Yeah, thanks so much, Rebecca. And thank you, Kendall and Christina. Um, and thanks to everyone who um, attended and participated. Uh, be sure to sign up for the other sessions over the course of the next two days. Um, and uh, you will also receive uh, a recording of the session. Thank you again and uh, have a wonderful day.